Hey and welcome, I'm Hammy. Today we're going to be doing a lore analysis and walkthrough of Overwatch's brand new short story, Bastet. Now, Bastet follows the reunion of Arna Amari and Jack Morrison straight after the events of the comic released on Arna's hero release in 2016, Old Soldiers. Covering backstory of Overwatch as an organization, Arna, Morrison, Gabriel Reyes, Reaper, the world and more, it's truly an awesome piece of lore and a great start to 2019 for you Overwatch story fans. This whole short story ties together so many Overwatch lore references over the last three years and beyond. Things from comics, hero origin stories, animated shorts, map lore and more. I'll be covering it all for you in this video if you need a refresher. Do use the time codes if you want to skip around. Let's get stuck in. Picking up immediately at the end of the Old Soldiers comic, we see the aftermath of Arna and Soldier 76, or Jack Morrison's, intervention in the base of Hakim, someone who we found out was meeting with Gabriel Reyes, or Reaper, in the events of that comic. In the aftermath of the confrontation between Arna, Reaper, and Soldier 76, or Morrison, we hear Arna's thoughts as to what had been going on before then, and more details on her thoughts and memories on the revelation that Gabriel and Jack, two men like brothers to her, were in fact not actually dead. We hear more detail in the conversation in the aftermath between her and Morrison before the two escape before local law enforcement arrive. Jack Morrison, Soldier 76, ends up collapsing due to his injuries and has to be carried off to a safe space by Arna. Waking up having been sewn back together after his injuries, Morrison finds himself in the surroundings of the necropolis, where Anna has been staying ever since she was released from the Polish hospital after the events of her comic, Legacy, the fateful mission where she discovered that Amélie Lacroix had actually become a talent assassin, causing her to hesitate in the moment that made her lose her eye and disappear from public life, leading people to think that she was dead discussing Jack's rather unusual wounds that weren't healing as quickly as they normally would, and whether consulting Angela Ziegler or Mercy would be a good idea. The two catch up on what's been going on since their respective disappearances and missing presumed deaths, although we hear a lot more about what happened to Arna rather than what happened to Jack Morrison or Soldier 76 in the years following the Swiss headquarters incident. We discover more about Morrison's motivations and his desire to go after Talon before he is forced by Arna to spend more time recovering by a healthy dose of sedative in the tea that she's given him. Having slept for two days, Morrison awakens and is fed by Arna before having a discussion as to where the two's paths will take them from here. Arna believes Morrison is stubborn, he is seeking revenge, and he is not letting go of the past and trying to move on, like Arna has attempted to, whereas Morrison believes that the two are actually after the same thing, and that Arna's effort to defend and protect and restore Cairo, the state of which she feels slightly responsible for after Overwatch's intervention over a decade ago, Arna's efforts to shrike the bounty hunter in Morrison's eyes are sweating the small stuff, and she's not seeing, in his world, the bigger picture that Talon is a menace, that they are behind what Hakim is doing in Cairo because Hakim is working for them, and that ultimately Anna would be better served if she wants to protect Cairo by helping him go after Talon. Morrison storms out, saying that if Anna's not going to take out the most dangerous target first, as used to be her job as Overwatch's sniper, then he was going to get on without her. Arna spends time looking through the computer intelligence that Morrison was having a look at, while Morrison takes a walk through the streets of Cairo, reflecting on Arna's words. Returning to Arna in the necropolis, Morrison says that he'll help with Hakim if Arna will then come with him afterwards. Arna agrees, but says that they have to use a more cautious approach rather than diving straight in, as happened last time in the events of Old Soldiers. Setting up a stakeout of one of Hakim's network of safe houses, the two reminisce further about the past, including Morrison giving us revelations as to the photos that we now know he was having a look at in the events of the Overwatch Christmas Reflections comic a couple of years back. Discussing their various past loves, relationships, and family lives, or lack of them, the two are suddenly interrupted when Hakim starts walking into the safe house opposite, and as the two walk out to go on their first mission together in several years, Anna picks up a particular mask, a new persona that she's taking on. Inspired by Soldier 76 that Morrison has taken on, Anna has decided to become Bastet, the Guardian, an ancient Egyptian symbol of strength, royalty, pharaohs, lions, and the sun. After a week, the two are packing up the necropolis base and Anna is sealing up the relics that she intends to leave behind, potentially to her daughter Farah or Fariha, who she has left another note for. Apparently Anna didn't receive a reply to the first letter that she sent in the events of her origin trailer. As the two prepare to leave, Anna makes it clear to Jack that she doesn't think this is a good idea. 
she already had to let go of Talon Overwatch and Gabriel, and to her it hurt, warning Morrison that he may well have to let go of things that hurt him or that are beyond saving. The two leave the necropolis with the golden mask of Bastet being a symbol of hope for everyone in Cairo. Right, that's the story, time for the analysis, and of course you should definitely give this a read yourself if you haven't already. Firstly, I'll talk a bit about the setting and how this ties into the universe. Now, this is of course, as I said, set shortly after Old Soldiers. A lot of the footage that I'll be showing from that comic is here, and of course that'll all be linked in the description below, as well as my lore analysis of that comic. Bear in mind it was done when the comic was released a couple of years ago now. All of the videos that are related to this will be linked in the description below, so you can get yourself caught up on all of the previous Overwatch lore too. Now, Hakim, the figure, the criminal that Soldier and Anna are after, has been mentioned, of course, in that comic, and we get a bit more information about him. Now, Anna in Old Soldiers said that she'd been hunting him and sort of carefully approaching him, working out his operation until kind of Soldier jumped in and kind of blew the lid off everything. We find out that Hakim runs a criminal organization. Well, that's no massive surprise, but it's actually been having a big effect on Cairo. The police and the government either turned a blind eye or they were being paid off by him, and it's having an effect on the general well-being of the citizens. Food supplies aren't being distributed to people who need them, medical care is almost impossible to get. And these are the reasons why Anna, in her conversations with Morrison, doesn't actually want to leave with him to go and chase after Talon. She feels that she has local responsibilities to sort out the mess that Hakim has caused. Now, in addition to this setting of the post-Old Soldiers Hakim story, we also get a bit more information about Egypt and about Overwatch's involvement in it. Now, now we discover that this is roughly a decade after Overwatch's intervention in Egypt. Now timelining in Overwatch, given all of the different relative dates we've been given, is an inexact science at best, but relatively speaking, depending on how much time you think has gone on since the events of the museum trailer or when Overwatch as a game launched, let's say Overwatch roughly collapsed seven or eight or so years ago in the timeline, so this was kind of two or three years before that, if we're going ten years ago or so. Now interestingly, Overwatch intervened and it shut down the Anubis project. Anna cites this later in the story as being an event that Egypt has actually never recovered from and that people's lives are hard. Which is actually really interesting because this ties in, as do so many things in this short story, to other pieces of Overwatch lore we've already seen. Far as Mission Statement comic, we discover that Helix Security are actually guarding Anubis um, and then around and after the Omnic Crisis, uh, Overwatch shut down or sort of tried to bottle up various god AIs and Anubis was probably one of these that Helix has then guarded afterwards. But it's interesting that after the Anubis project was shut down by Overwatch, Egypt never recovered. So even though if this was say a decade or so ago that Overwatch intervened to shut down the Anubis project, then it's interesting that Anubis was probably doing good things maybe for Egypt and Cairo as well, but if Overwatch intervened and shut it down then maybe they were just scared that it would perhaps contribute to future Omnic problems or something like the Omnic crisis again. So showing that Overwatch's intervention in various places didn't actually have universally positive effects and the aftermath of this in Egypt and Cairo is very plain to see from this short story. Anna says now there is a lot of crime, the growing influence of people like Hakim and his gang and criminals associated with him, and amidst the world of hover taxis and indeed robo camels that tourists are apparently still travelling on, as said by this story. There is also a gulf apparently between the well-off and the poor in terms of how people are getting around. Overwatch legacy here that Anna actually partially feels responsible for, even if it wasn't directly or entirely her decision. Now interestingly, as they go through the streets of Cairo, it reminds Morrison of Prague, uh, another mission where apparently Anna says she had to carry Jack out over her shoulder, and she actually says that it was Jack's fault that something went wrong there because he believed that Reinhardt could be stealthy. Now I just laughed out loud when I saw that, that's a wonderful image. And we actually get a few more quips about Mike Reinhardt between the two of them through this story as well. I love the back and forth. Now as well as learning about the setting and about Egypt, we also learn of course about the characters involved. So let's start with Anna. Well from the detail that we've seen in game that she has a targeting visor inside her cowl that sadly doesn't actually show up Reyes directly after their confrontation, we even learn stuff like her being a bad cook as the two make a joke about it while Morrison is recovering. Sadly we also learn a bit more about her family history, we get a bit of reinforcement of things we've already learned in Anna's origin story, trailer and various comics in the past, including why she felt she couldn't return to Faria. When she decided to hesitate when she saw Amélie Lacroix as the identity of the Talon assassin, she felt that Captain Amari couldn't actually return. She felt that Freya was going to want Captain Amari back and she couldn't be that person after what had happened both on the mission and in her recovery 
afterwards. Looking at the photo in Necropolis in the story, Anna is actually referencing the photo of her and Farah, her and Faria, in the Anna origin trailer as well. Just another one of so many references in this story to various bits of Overwatch lore and things we've seen in the past. As well as her reflections on Farah, we also see a little bit on her relationship with her husband Sam, as Morrison is discussing a potential relationship, a potential piece of his past he had to leave behind. She runs her finger around the place on her finger where her wedding ring used to be. As Morrison mentions her ex-husband, we presume Sam. She's not mentioned to him that she's alive, we know that. Uh, maybe she'll tell him something about it eventually, she says. But Anna says, I made a big enough mess of his life without having to give him the news. None of us are very good at saying goodbye, are we? One of many reflections that Anna and Soldier 76 make on their pasts both together and their individual pasts and how Overwatch has changed and affected those. I really, really love the little details as well, like her friendship with Morrison. Uh, there's kind of double act humour and comic timing, sort of banter and jokes back and forth, including Anna sleep darting a guard that Morrison missed at the beginning and sort of saying, you missed one, to the various sort of jokes they have. You can see how close friends they are, right up to the point where, as Morrison kind of is forced to relax by her as she slipped him some sedative in his tea, she notes when he's resting that he has scars she doesn't recognise now. She did recognise his scars in the past. The two were clearly close brothers and sisters in arms indeed. We even get little details that when Anna brings Jack a cup of tea she's silent as a stalking cat in Morrison's eyes as he sees her coming over. It's a nice little foreshadowing for the persona bastard that she'll adapt later in the story. Now as well as Anna's attitudes and backstory we also get a bunch about Jack Morrison or Soldier 76 from his past life and potential loves through to how his soldier enhancement program abilities such as healing work. There's quite a lot to cover here so again check the time codes in the description below if you want to skip between various bits. Even from the very aftermath of the battle with Rares, we hear about how his wounds actually appear and how Arna actually views how Jack's healing works. Apparently his wounds can heal themselves, a legacy of his past as a test subject and an enhanced soldier in the American Armed Forces. This manifests, as Arna can see it immediately, as pink edges of new skin forming around the edges of the wound immediately. But apparently where it looked the worst here, his flesh had turned necrotic and black, which to Arna, in the context, sounds a little bit unusual. It looks as though his wounds normally seal up and heal quite quickly, but this blackness is something new. Now, the immediate thing that springs to mind is something to do with Reaper or Rares is Hellfire shotgun rounds. Maybe there's something there that's anti the technology, anti the regeneration or the fast healing that Jack Morrison has. And indeed, if a Reaper is working with someone who's working on his own state, for example, which we'll talk about in a bit, then maybe there's been a bit of comparing of notes and work on his weapons indeed. Now, as the two attempt to escape through Cairo and Jack's wounds get the better of him, Anna is actually forced to pick up Jack and lift him, carrying him away down the alley. So Anna, still in her slightly older age, still being very, very strong, totally capable of uh, Feynman's lifting Morrison and getting him away very, very quickly. Also, because Necropolis is actually nowhere near Cairo, if you look at the distances, then she's carried him a fair old way as well, as Morrison wakes up in the sanctuary of Anna's safe house. Now, before reaching safety, Jack was to Anna actually laboring. It seemed like his genetic enhancements weren't really helping him in this situation, which begs the question of what has actually happened to him. Is it a problem with his genetic enhancements or is it something to do with the shots that Reaper or Reyes actually used on him? Now, he doesn't want to go and see Mercy because Anna does mention maybe they should go and see Angela. Now, that's a reference to Recall when uh, Anna says that Mercy isn't far away. At the end of Recall, when Winston fires off the recall, we see that Mercy might actually be somewhere roughly in the Middle East. In Reflections, the Christmas comic of 2016, we actually saw her in a sandy or tent environment, potentially getting Genji's letter. So again, two different references there, trying to tie Mercy into the story and this point in time, I think, which I really, really love. The attempts, the real, real effort and success in many areas, I think, of the consistency tying together different bits of past Overwatch lore into this story, and hopefully it's still like this going forward. 
Now, when Anna reflects on her surprise that Morrison is still alive, although she wasn't entirely sure that he was dead, and the same for Rez, she very much reflects that Jack uh, didn't seem too surprised that Gabriel was still alive. And indeed, when Jack storms out uh, after his discussion with Anna, she can actually see that Morrison had various intelligence on the Reaper's movements, on what he was up to, and a lot more. Now, Anna does reflect on who had been supplying Morrison with this information which is an interesting point. She also reflects that the other information he had, a spider web of corporations, government officials and financial institutions, was not his strong suit. Uh, he preferred things with two sides, facts that were concrete, uh, and that the messy stuff was more Gabriel's arena. So who would give soldiers such information? Well, who has a spider web of information uh, that she has been consulting a lot? Look, if Winston wasn't tipping off Morrison with various stuff, uh, then let's say that probably Sombra, in the same way that she maybe has perhaps, who knows, got in touch with McCree, uh, maybe has perhaps got in touch with other people in the Overwatch cast, let's say, like all of her voice lines, when she's having a little chat with people here and there. Maybe she's tipped off soldier, who knows. Now, as Morrison makes his recovery in Necropolis, we learn a bit more about his and Anna's indeed shared history. Now, Anna mentions in Necropolis that she's been sending relics to Dr. Faisal. This is again another really cool reference. Dr. Faisal is mentioned several places in the Petra Deathmatch level. Now, we previously knew nothing really about Faisal and his affiliation, but a symbol that might be the organization that he works for. Do check out my Petra Map Law video, again, linked in the description below if you want to see all of those references. But clearly, he's um, uh, archaeologist, if not with ties to the old Overwatch, then certainly with ties or an association with Arna. Arna has been staying in the Necropolis ever since she left hospital in Poland after the events of her legacy comic. Now, Janina Kowalski, or Kowalska, the Jane Doe name that she was given, that all ties up with the Arna hero teasers shared in various places, like her hospital record card when Arna was being teased as the first new hero of Overwatch post-launch. We also learn from Morrison's perspective about how he felt and how Overwatch responded to Honor going missing after the events of Legacy. Now, Reyes actually apparently even put McCree on it personally. Uh, we know that McCree hadn't left Blackwatch or Overwatch at this point then there, and Gabe indeed trusted McCree as a sort of troubleshooter, covert agent, kind of a fixer man. We actually saw him doing this in Uprising, even though in the events of Uprising he had been deployed without Arn or Jack knowing why he was in London, of course, in the events of that comic. As the two old soldiers go over the events of Legacy and of Arna's disappearance, we learn from Morrison that he actually knew, even before Arna said anything, that Amélie Lacroix was the assassin, and apparently Morrison had learnt that and more over the years, but left it unspoken, which begs the question, what has Soldier 76, what has Morrison learnt about Amélie Lacroix, about Talon, about her potential conversion and indeed brainwashing as it's described in her bio to become this nearly emotionless assassin. Now, last but by no means least, final new piece as it were of Soldier 76's lore, or indeed one of the big ones, is found out in the preparation for the final mission against Hakim and his organization. Now we learn that Morrison is going after Talon, Anna drugs him to send him to sleep, but lets him finish his rest. She's torn between continuing her Shrike work as a bounty hunter and leaving it unfinished, not leaving Cairo properly recovered. But but Morrison then returns, having stormed out, and says that he will help her get Hakim. She agrees only if he makes sure the city is secure before they then both go after potentially Reaper and Talon. But Anna is very much doing this to keep an eye on Morrison rather than because she thinks it's a good idea, and she expands on that more later in the story. Taking a room in an apartment building, stalking out and staking out one of Hakim's safe houses ties very much into the reflections panel, where we see Anna and Morrison uh, with Morrison having a look at a photograph, the contents of which are quite faded. We actually learn more about it. Anna is actually passed a stack of photos by Morrison. The first is the one that we've seen indeed at the end of Old Soldiers. We learn that it's actually after a battle in Rio where Gabriel apparently was already showing signs of stress of leadership weighing on him. So this is therefore original strike team days before Overwatch as an organization was formally founded and Morrison was given the strike commander job. Gabe was in command at this point in time in this photo. Now. 
We also get a close-up of the second photo he was looking at, as well as a big conversation and explanation, which is, of course, the big lead news about this story that you will have probably seen all over YouTube thumbnails and, indeed, Twitter and everywhere else and news articles. Now, I come to it here not because I think it's unimportant, but because it's in the order of this video and because I like the way, very much like the discussion of Tracer and other things, that the Overwatch team has actually done this. So, coming to it in order rather than making it the focus of absolutely everything. There is so much cool story stuff in this short story, of which this is a really, really cool part. I just want to make sure it's all done justice. I hope that's okay. As Anna rifles through Jack's stack of photos that he's been carrying around with him, there's one of Jack who'd stepped off a military transport for leave, but there was the other person in the picture, a dark-haired man dressed in a casual black button-up shirt. Jack's arm was around his shoulder. Vincent, Anna recognises the photo. Now, apparently, Arna makes a little joke. Are you keeping a candle for him? And Jack says, oh, nothing like that. Uh, he's married, uh, they're very happy, and Jack is happy for him. So we actually learn that Jack uh, identifies as gay. It was confirmed, as it always would be, by Michael Chu on Twitter not too long ago that Jack and Vincent were in a romantic relationship many years ago and both identify as gay. So there we have it. Very much like Tracer, I really appreciate that this has been brought into this story in a meaningful way that helps us shed light on the past of Jack Morrison, the man, of him and his relationships and his history and also Overwatch's history as well. It is not a one-off fact, not just something that's dropped in and left, it's by no means just a throwaway. It's really, really integrated into helping us learn more about Morrison and about maybe the kind of life he's had to lead and the kind of sacrifices he had to make and potentially this revenge-filled persona that he apparently has, the sacrifice and things that he's made along the way. So it's been really, really good to see this uh, discussed and included in the way about it is, is really a part of telling the story in a natural way, very much I feel, the way that Trace was introduced in Reflections. As we discovered in a very natural way as part of the story, Trace is sort of not being able to pop back in on Emily as often as she would like in the events of Bastet, we actually see a little bit of a reflection by Jack on his past life. Vincent deserved a happier life than the one I could give him. Anna actually reflects as well, at least you and Gabe managed to have families. In the Reflections comic, this actually gives us a bit more thought on the image where we see a Reaper in the background looking at what looks to be a little family unit. Uh, Michael Chu had said that those aren't random people, so this probably reflects more, although it doesn't 100% confirm it, we probably imagine now that Reaper, uh, that Reyes, is checking in on his family, the family that we now know that he managed to have. Speaking of Reaper, speaking of Reyes, although he is of course only mentioned in this comic, we do learn a couple of things. Uh, Anna, what she actually saw when she took off that mask and looked so shocked, uh, she saw a ruin of a face according to the short story, but she was able to recognize him. And also when she was walking through uh, and reading through sort of various intelligence that Morrison had collected on the Reaper attacks, casualties in one of his attacks had suffered similar wounds to Morrison's. Uh, Anna says that damned scientist is the first thing that she thinks. And I love that. Clearly a hint uh, or a reflection that Anna believes that Moira is working with Reaper as we know the two are working together uh, in terms of talent. And when Reaper, way back when Oasis was introduced, had a voice line to Sombra of going to visit an old friend. Moira and Reaper, Moira and Reyes have since had voice lines where uh, Moira comments on Reyes's condition from the events of Moira's introduction. Michael Chu had mentioned that Moira was kind of brought on to kind of help uh, Reyes with managing his kind of condition, apparently. So with all of the work that Moira has done with Reyes over the years, it's quite possible that she maybe has done a few little tweaks on his ammunition in some way or another. If she's kind of got this necrotizing kind of rounds or this necrotizing effect where it's sort of causing flesh to die very, very quickly or something like that. After a lot of retrospection, the two are snapped out of it when they see Hakim entering the safe house on his rotation of safe houses. As the two pick up their weapons and go to go out, Anna actually picks up a mask, actually a relic that she's found in the necropolis by the sounds of things. And apparently she's been inspired by Jack Soldier 76, uh, the name that is known by the world, the name that enemies are afraid will come and find them. So to try and protect Cairo after she has gone, with Jack, Anna is taking on the persona of a protector, the protector Bastet. Now, she calls Bastet scarier than an old lady, and then Soldier actually cracks, oh no, there's nothing scarier than an old lady. And Anna says, oh, you would know, as the two go out to apprehend Hakim. Now, I love the reference to Bastet. Uh, I might just do an entire video on this, uh, but to very, very briefly summarize, Bastet 
is or was a goddess of ancient Egypt. Now she was worshipped as early as the second dynasty, very, very early on in the dynasties of Egypt. Um, she used to be bast before she got the tet or the et sort of part added to her name. She was originally a very fierce lioness warrior goddess of the sun as priests in ancient Egypt are various different gods. You would have various local gods. Some of them would uh, gain power, gain prestige, and as they did, so their gods would as well, such as the dual-natured Amun-Ra later in the dynasties of Egypt. As Bastet grew in power, she would also wane in power as well or influence. She then became more of a cat goddess. At the height of her influence, she was seen as the defender and protector of Lower Egypt, defender of the pharaoh, and also of the sun god Ra himself. Now, even when she was given more of a cat-like nature, cats were still held in extremely high regard in ancient Egypt as well. So this was not an insult by any means, but it was certainly a little less of status that she had as a goddess later in her life, and indeed later in the Egyptian dynasties. As Morrison promises to catch Anna up on Reinhardt's escapades ever since she dropped off the map, the two seal up the necropolis and head out after Talon, as Jack says that they need to go and pay a visit to some old friends. Now, who are the old friends? What is going to happen next in the story of Overwatch? Certainly this is tying together a lot of past threads, referring to lots of cool stuff, giving us more insight into Jack Morrison, into Arna Amari, into the world of Overwatch, the world of Cairo. And in Overwatch's first officially released short story of over 5,000 words, it is a brilliant way of expanding the lore and telling more stories in the world of Overwatch. The first that we've seen a brilliant kickoff to 2019 and I'm really really hopeful from this after what has been a quiet law period and indeed a quiet comic period in 2018 that we've got lots of great stuff to come in the world of Overwatch story. What did you think of this story? Uh, what bits did you enjoy? Uh, if you have different opinions on events in the story and I'm sure you do uh, because it would be a boring world if we all had the same opinions and views. Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Do let me know where you think the story could go from here. Who are the old friends that Jack and Anna are going to go and visit? Uh, what do you think of the various revelations of the various details that we've been given in this story. There's so much detail. I love the way it ties so much stuff together in a really congruent and sort of ordered way as well as just giving us so much cool detail and insight into the characters of two of Overwatch's key protagonists as well both as a story and as an organization i'd love to hear what you think in the comments below now if you like my video please do throw a like subscribe comment if you're new to this channel or if you want to refresh it on your memory i've covered everything to do with overwatch lore and story since before the game released all comics all animated shorts and everything referred to in this video and more is all covered in the playlist here so please do check those out thanks to my patrons on patreon who make videos like this quite frankly possible if you'd like to see how you could support my channel and all of the additional Overwatch lore videos and indeed more lore videos on other games and stories that I'll be doing in the future, please do check out patreon.com forward slash Hammy. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.